Chapter 18 The woman who hunts earned the full title during the winter that began her tenth year. Isa felt a private satisfaction and a small sense of relief when she noticed the changes in the girl that heralded the onset of monarchy. Ayla's spreading hips and the two bumps swelling her chest, changing the contours of her straight child's body, assured the woman that her unusual daughter was not doomed to perennial childhood after all. Swelling nipples and a light down of pubic and underarm hair were followed by Ayla's first menstrual flow, the first time the spirit of her totem battled with another. Ayla understood now that it was unlikely she would ever give birth. Her totem was too strong. She wanted a baby. Ever since Uba was born, she had wanted a baby of her own to love and care for. But she accepted the trials and restrictions imposed by the powerful cave lion. She always enjoyed caring for the infants and children of the growing clan when their mothers were busy, and she felt a pang of remorse when they went to someone else to nurse. But at least now she was a woman, no longer a child who was taller than a woman. Ayla felt an empathetic sense of identity with Ovra, who had miscarried several more times, though earlier in her pregnancies and not with as much difficulty. Ovra's beaver totem was a little too ferocious, too. She seemed destined to be childless. Ever since the mammoth hunt, and especially after Ayla reached physical adulthood, the two young women often shared each other's company. The quiet woman didn't talk much. She was reticent by nature, the opposite of Ika's open and friendly disposition. But Ayla and Ovra developed an understanding that ripened slowly into a close friendship and extended to include Goof. The fondness between the young acolyte and his mate was apparent to everyone. It made Ovra the object of greater pity, since her mate was so understanding and gentle about her inability to produce a child for him, they knew it made her want a baby even more. Oga was expecting again, much to Browd's delight. She had gotten pregnant soon after weaning three-year-old Brack. It looked as though she was going to be as prolific as Aga and Ika. Droog was sure Aga's two-year-old son would be the tool maker he wanted when he found the boy banging stones together one day. He found a hammer stone to fit Groob's pudgy little hand and allowed him to play nearby when he worked, hitting broken pieces of flint to mimic the napper. Ika's two-year-old, Igra, promised to be as outgoing as her mother, a cheerful, chubby, friendly little girl that delighted everyone. Brun's clan was growing. Ayla spent the few days in early spring away from the clan, her required woman's curse, in the small cave of her high retreat. After the far more traumatic death curse, it was almost a holiday. She used the time to work out the kinks and sharpen her throwing skills after the long winter though she had to remind herself constantly that she no longer had to be so secretive about it. Though she had little trouble securing food for herself, she looked forward to her daily visits with Isa at a prearranged place near the cave of the clan. Isa brought her more food than she could hope to eat, but more she brought company. It was still difficult to spend her nights alone, though the knowledge that the ostracism was limited and of short duration made it easier. They often visited until dark, and Ayla had to use a torch to find her way back. Isa never got over her nervousness about the deer skin Ayla had made for herself while she was dead, so the young woman decided to leave it in the small cave. Ayla learned the things a woman needed to know from her mother, just as all young women did. Isa gave her the straps of soft, absorbent leather that were worn tied to a waist thong and explained the proper symbols to make when she buried the straps soiled with menstrual flow deep in the ground. She was told the proper position to assume if a man decided to relieve his needs with her, the movements to make, and how to clean herself afterward. Ayla was a woman now. She could be required to fulfill all the functions of a fully adult female member of the clan. They talked of many things of interest to women, though some were familiar to her from her medical training. They discussed childbirth, nursing, and medicine to relieve cramps. Isa explained the positions and motions considered seductive to men of the clan. 
the ways that a woman might encourage a man to develop a desire to relieve his needs. They talked of the responsibilities of a mated woman. Isa told Ayla all the things her mother had told her, but privately she wondered if the unattractive girl would ever have need for much of the knowledge. There was one subject Isa never brought up. Most young women, by the time they became women, usually had their eye on a particular young man. Though neither a girl nor her mother had any direct say in the matter, the mother, if she was on good terms with her mate, could tell him of her daughter's wishes. The mate, if he chose, could make them known to the leader, with whom the decision rested. If there were no other considerations, and especially if the young man in question had shown an interest in the girl, the leader might let the young woman's wishes prevail. Not always, certainly not in Isa's case, but the subjects of mates never came up between Isa and Ayla, though it was usually one of great interest to a nubile young woman and her mother. There were no young, unmated men in the clan, and Isa was sure if there had been, they would not have wanted Ayla any more than any man in the clan wanted her as a second woman and Ayla herself had no interest in any of them. She hadn't even thought about a mate until Isa brought up the subject of a mated woman's responsibilities. But she thought about it later. On a sunny spring morning not long after she returned, Ayla went to fill a water bag at the spring-fed pool near the cave. No one else was out yet. She knelt down and bent over, ready to dip the bag in, then suddenly stopped. The morning sun slanting across the still water gave it a mirror-like surface. Ayla stared at the strange face looking at her out of the pool. She had not seen a reflection of herself before. Most water near the cave was in the form of running streams or creeks, and she didn't usually look in the pool until after she had dipped in the container she wanted to fill, disturbing the tranquil surface. The young woman studied her own face. It was somewhat square, with a well-defined jaw, modified by cheeks still rounded with youth, high cheekbones, and a long, smooth neck. Her chin had the hint of a cleft, her lips were full, and her nose straight and finely chiseled. Clear, blue-gray eyes were outlined with heavy lashes a shade or two darker than the golden hair that fell in thick, soft waves to well below her shoulders, glimmering with highlights in the sun. Eyebrows, the same shade as her lashes, arched above her eyes on a smooth, straight, high forehead without the slightest hint of protruding brow ridges. Ayla backed stiffly away from the pool and ran into the cave. Ayla, what's wrong? Isa motioned. It was obvious something was troubling her daughter. Mother, I just looked in the pool. I'm so ugly! Oh, mother, why am I so ugly? was her impassioned response. She burst into tears in the woman's arms. For as long as she could remember, Ayla had never seen anyone except people of the clan. She had no other standard of measure. They had grown accustomed to her, but to herself she looked different from everyone around her. Abnormally different. Ayla, Ayla... Isa soothed, holding the sobbing young woman in her arms. I didn't know I was so ugly, mother. I didn't know. What man will ever want me? I'll never have a mate, and I'll never have a baby. I'll never have anyone. Why do I have to be so ugly? I don't know if you're really so ugly, Ayla. You're different. I'm ugly, I'm ugly. Ayla shook her head, refusing to be comforted. Look at me! I'm too big! I'm taller than Brown and Goove! I'm almost as tall as Brun! And I'm ugly! I'm big and ugly and I'll never have a mate! She gestured with fresh sobs. Ayla, stop it! Isa commanded, shaking her shoulders. You can't help the way you look. You were not born to the clan, Ayla. You were born to the others. You look the way they look. You can't change that. You must accept it. It's true you may never have a mate. That can't be helped. 
you must accept that too. But it's not certain. It's not hopeless. Soon you will be a medicine woman, a medicine woman of my line. Even without a mate, you will not be a woman without status, without value. Next summer is the clan gathering. There will be many clans there. This is not the only clan, you know. You may find a mate in one of the other clans. Maybe not a young man or one with high status, but a mate. Zug thinks very well of you. You are fortunate that he holds you in such high regard. He has already given Kreb a message to take with him. Zug has kin in another clan. He told Kreb to tell them of his regard for you. He thinks you will make some man a good mate and wants them to consider you. He even said he would take you if he were younger. Remember that. This is not the only clan. These are not the only men in the world. Zug said that? Even though I'm so ugly? Ayla gestured, a look of hope in her eyes. Yes, Zug said that. With his recommendation and the status of my line, I'm sure there will be some man who will take you, even if you do look different. Ayla's tremulous smile faded. But won't that mean I'll have to go away? Live someplace else? I don't want to leave you and Kreb and Uba. Ayla, I am old. Kreb is no young man either, and in a few years Oba will be a woman and made it. What will you do then? Isa motioned. Someday Brun will pass the leadership on to Brout. I don't think you should live with this clan when Brout becomes leader. I think it might be best if you moved away, and the clan gathering may be your opportunity. I suppose you're right, Mother. I don't think I want to live here when Broud is leader, but I hate the thought of leaving you, she said with a frown, then brightened. But next summer is a whole year away. I don't have to worry about it until then. A whole year, Isa thought. My Ayla, my child. Maybe you have to be my age to know how fast a year goes. You don't want to leave me? You don't know how I'll miss you. If only there were a man in this clan who would take you. If only Browd were not going to be leader. But the woman gave no hint of her thoughts as Ayla wiped her eyes and went back to get water. This time she avoided looking in the still pool. Later that afternoon, Ayla stood at the edge of the woods looking through the brush at the cave. Several people were outside working or talking. She shifted the two rabbits that were slung over her shoulder, looked down at the sling tucked in her waist thong, stuffed it in a fold of her wrap, then took it out and tucked it back at her waist in plain sight. She looked again at the cave, shuffling nervously. Brun said I could, she thought. They had a ceremony so I could. I'm a hunter. I'm the woman who hunts. Ayla lifted her chin and stepped out from behind the concealing screen of foliage. For a long, frozen moment, everyone outside the cave stopped and stared at the young woman walking toward them with two rabbits slung over her shoulder. As soon as they got over the shock and realized their bad manners, they looked away. Ayla's face burned, but she walked straight ahead with dogged determination, ignoring the surreptitious glances. She was relieved to reach the cave after passing the gauntlet of shocked looks and glad for its cool, dim interior. It was easier to ignore the looks of the people inside. Isa's eyes opened wide, too, when Ayla reached Kreb's hearth, but recovering quickly, she looked away, making no mention of the rabbits. She didn't know what to say. Kreb was sitting on his bearskin, apparently meditating, and didn't seem to notice her. He had seen her come into the cave, and by the time she reached the hearth, he had managed to mask his expression. No one said a thing as she put the animals down beside the fireplace. A moment later, Uba came racing in, and she had no qualms at all about her reactions. "'Did you really hunt those yourself, Ayla?' she asked. "'Yes,' Ayla nodded. "'They look like nice, fat rabbits.' 
Are we going to have them for dinner, Mother? Well, yes, I guess we are, Isa replied, still embarrassed and unsure. I'll skin them, Ayla said quickly, taking out her knife. Isa watched for a moment, then walked over and took the knife from her hand. No, Ayla, you hunted them. I'll skin them. Ayla stepped back while Isa skinned the rabbits, quickly spitted them, and put them over the fire. She was just as uncomfortable as Isa. That was a good meal, Isa, Kreb said later, still avoiding direct comment about Ayla's hunting. But Oba felt no such compunction. Those were good rabbits, Ayla, but next time why don't you get some ptarmigan, she said. Uba shared Kreb's predilection for the fat birds with the feathered feet. The next time Ayla brought her kill to the cave, it wasn't such a shock, and before long her hunting became almost commonplace. With a hunter at his own hearth, Kreb reduced the share he took from the other hunters, except for the large animals hunted only by the men. It was a busy spring for Ayla. Her share of the women's work was not lessened because she hunted, and there were still Isa's herbs to be collected. But Ayla loved it. She was full of energy, happier than she could remember. She was happy she could hunt without secrecy, happy to be back with the clan, and happy she was finally a woman, and glad for the closer relationship she was developing with the other women. Ebra and Uka accepted her, though the two older women never could quite forget she was different. Ika had always been friendly, and the attitudes of Aga and her mother had completely reversed since she saved Ona from drowning. Ovra had become a close confidant, and Oga warmed toward her despite Browd. The adolescent ardor Oga had felt for the man had moderated to an indifferent habit, cooled by the years of living with his unpredictable outbursts. But Browd's vindictive hatred of Ayla grew after her acceptance as a hunter, he kept trying to find ways to bedevil her, kept trying to get a reaction out of her. His harassment had become a way of life she had learned to live with. It left her unmoved. She had begun to think he would never be able to disturb her again. Spring was in full flower the day she decided to hunt ptarmigan for Kreb's favorite dish. She thought she would look over the new growths and begin restocking Isa's pharmacopoeia while she was at it. She spent the morning ranging the nearby countryside, then headed for a broad meadow near the steps. She flushed a couple of low-flying fowl, brought down quickly by swifter stones, then searched through the tall grass looking for a nest and hopefully some eggs. Kreb liked the birds stuffed with their own eggs in a nest of edible greens and herbs. She uttered an exclamation of joy when she spied it, and carefully wrapped the eggs in soft moss and tucked them into a deep fold of her wrap. She was delighted with herself. Out of sheer joyful exuberance, she sprinted across the meadow in a fast run, coming to a halt out of breath at the top of a knoll covered with new green grass. Flopping to the ground, she checked her eggs to make sure they were undamaged and took out a piece of dried meat to lunch on. She watched a bright yellow-breasted meadowlark trill gloriously from an open perch, then take to wing and continue its song in flight. A pair of golden-crowned sparrows, warbling their woeful tune of descending pitch, flitted among the blackberry canes at the border of the open field. Another pair of black-capped, gray-coated birds, named by the chickadee of their call, darted in and out of their nesting hole in a fir tree near a small creek winding its way through the dense vegetation at the foot of the knoll. Small, vivacious brown wrens scolded the others as they carried twigs and dried moss to a nest cavity in an ancient gnarled apple tree, proving its youthful fecundity with its flock of pink blooms. Ayla loved these moments of solitude. Basking in the sun, feeling relaxed and content, she thought about nothing in particular, except the beautiful day and how happy she was. She was completely unaware that anyone else was near until a shadow fell across the ground in front of her. Startled, she looked up into Browd's glowering face. No hunting trips had been planned for that day, and Browd had decided to hunt alone. He hadn't been very diligent 
His hunting foray was more of an excuse to take a walk on the warm spring day than to provide meat he didn't necessarily need. He had seen Ayla relaxing on the knoll from a distance and couldn't pass up the opportunity to berate her for laziness, caught in the act of sitting still. Ayla jumped up when she saw him, but that annoyed him. She was taller and he didn't like looking up at a woman. He motioned her down and prepared to give her a sound scolding, but as she lowered herself, the unresisting, unresponsive look that glazed her eyes irritated him even more. He wished he could think of some way to get a reaction out of her. At the cave, he could at least make her get something for him to see her jump to his command. He looked around, then down at the woman sitting at his feet, waiting with unruffled composure for him to get on with his rebuke and be on his way. She's worse than ever since she became a woman, he thought. The woman who hunts. How could Brun do it? He noticed her ptarmigan and thought of his own empty hand. Even the look on her ugly face is insolent. She's gloating because she got those birds and I don't have anything. What can I make her do? There's nothing out here I can tell her to get. Wait. She's a woman now, isn't she? There's something I can make her do. Browd gave her a signal, and Ayla's eyes flew open. It was unexpected. Isa told her men only wanted that from women they considered attractive. She knew Browd thought she was ugly. Browd hadn't missed Ayla's shocked surprise. Her reaction encouraged him. He signaled her again, imperiously, to assume the position so he could relieve his needs. The position for sexual intercourse. Ayla knew what was expected. Not only had Isa explained, she had often seen adult members of the clan engage in the activity. All the children had. There were no artificial restraints in the clan. Children learned adult behavior by emulating their parents, and sexual behavior was just one of many activities they mimicked. It always puzzled Ayla. She wondered why it was done, but it didn't disturb her to see a young boy bounce harmlessly on a young girl in conscious imitation of adults. Sometimes it was an imitation. Many young girls of the clan were pierced by pubescent boys who lingered in the limbo of not-yet-men before their first kill, and occasionally a man, beguiled by a young coquette, pleased himself with a not-quite-ripe female. Most young men, though, felt it beneath their dignity to play games with former playmates. But Ayla had no male playmates near her age except Vorn, and since the earlier days, when Aga actively discouraged their association, there had never developed any close contact between them. Ayla was not particularly fond of Vorn, who imitated Browd's actions toward her. Despite the incident on the practice field, the boy still idolized Browd, and Vorn was not about to play mates with Ayla. There was no one else who might have, so she had never engaged in the imitation of the act. Within a society that indulged in sex as naturally as they breathed, Ayla was still a virgin. The young woman felt awkward. She knew she must comply, but she was flustered and Browd was enjoying it. He was glad he had thought of it. He had finally broken down her defenses. It excited him to see her so confused and bewildered, and aroused him. He hovered close as she got up, then started to lower herself to her knees. Ayla wasn't accustomed to men of the clan being so near. Browd's heavy breathing frightened her. She hesitated. Browd got impatient, pushed her down, and moved aside his wrap, exposing his organ, thick and throbbing. What is she waiting for? She's so ugly she should be honored. No other man would have her, he thought angrily, grabbing at her wrap to move it out of the way as his need grew. But as Browd closed in on her, something snapped. She couldn't do it. 
She just couldn't. Her reason left her. It didn't matter that she was supposed to obey him. She scrambled to her feet and started to run. Browd was too quick for her. He grabbed her, pushed her down, and punched her in the face, cutting her lip with his hard fist. He was beginning to enjoy this. Too many times that he restrained himself when he wanted to beat her. But there was no one to stop him here. And he had justifiable reason. She was disobeying him. Actively disobeying him. Ayla was frantic. She tried to get up and he hit her again. He was getting a reaction from her he never expected. And it stirred him to greater arousal. He would cow this insolent woman yet. He hit her again and again, and felt a great satisfaction to see her cringe as he made a move to hit her once more. Her head was ringing. Blood trickled out of her nose and the corner of her mouth. She tried to get up, but he held her down. She struggled against him, pummeling his chest with her fists. They had no effect on his hard, muscular body, but her resistance aroused him to new heights. Never had he felt so stimulated. Violence increased his passion and lust added force to his blows. He reveled in her resistance and clouded her again. She was nearly unconscious when he threw her over on her face, feverishly ripped her wrap aside, and spread her legs. With one hard thrust, he penetrated deeply. She screamed with pain. It added to his pleasure. He lunged again, drawing forth another painful cry, then again and again. The intensity of his excitement urged him on, rising quickly to unbearable peaks. With a last hard drive that extracted a final agonized scream, he ejected his built-up heat. Browd collapsed on top of her for a moment, his energy spent. Then, still breathing heavily, he withdrew himself. Ayla sobbed incoherently. The salt from her tears stung the open wounds on her blood-smeared face. One eye was swollen nearly shut and turning dark. Her thighs were stained with blood and she hurt deep inside. Browd got up and looked down at her. He felt good. He had never enjoyed penetrating a woman so much. He picked up his weapons and headed back to the cave. Ayla lay with her face in the dirt long after her sobbing stopped. Finally, she pulled herself up. She touched her mouth, felt the swelling, and looked at the blood on her fingers. Her whole body ached, inside and out. She saw blood between her thighs and the stains on the grass. Is my totem fighting again? She wondered. No, I don't think so. It's not time. Browd must have wounded me. I didn't know he could beat me on the inside, too. But the other women don't hurt from it. Why should Browd's organ wound me? Is there something wrong with me? Slowly, she got up and walked to the creek, hurting with every step. She washed herself, but it didn't help the throbbing, aching pain or the turmoil in her mind. Why did Broud want me to do that? Isa says men want to relieve their needs with attractive women. I'm ugly. Why should a man want to hurt a woman he likes? But women like it, too. Why else would they make the gestures to encourage men? How can they like it? Oga never minds it when Browd does it to her, and he does it every day. More than once, sometimes. Suddenly, Ayla was horrified. What if Browd makes me do it again? I won't go back. I can't go back. Where can I go? My little cave? No, it's too close, and I can't stay there in winter. I have to go back. I can't live alone. Where else can I go? 
And I can't leave Iza and Crab and Uba. What am I going to do? If Brout wants it, I can't refuse him. None of the other women would even try. What's wrong with me? He never wanted that when I was still a girl. Why did I have to become a woman? I was so happy about it. Now I wouldn't care if I was a girl all my life. I'll never have a baby anyway. What good is being a woman if you can't have a baby? Especially if a man can make you do something like that. What good is it anyway? What's it for? The sun was low when she plodded back up the knoll to look for her tarm again. The eggs, cushioned so carefully, were crushed and stained the front of her wrap. She looked back at the creek and remembered how happy she was watching the birds. It seemed ages ago. Another time, another place. She dragged herself back to the cave, dreading every step. As Isa watched the sun disappear behind the trees in the west, she grew more anxious. She walked part way up all the paths in the nearby woods and to the ridge to scan the slope toward the steps. A woman shouldn't be out alone. I never do like it when Ayla hunts, Isa thought. What if she was attacked by some animal? Maybe she's hurt. Kreb was concerned too, though he tried not to show it. Even Brun began to worry as it grew dark. Isa was the first to see her walking toward the cave from the ridge. She started to scold her for making her worry, but stopped before her first gesture. Ayla, you're hurt. What happened? Brown beat me, she motioned, her expression dull. But why? I disobeyed him, the young woman gestured as she walked into the cave and straight to the hearth. What could have happened? Isa wondered. Ayla hasn't disobeyed Brout for years. Why would she rebel against him now? And why didn't he tell me he saw her? He knew I was worried. He's been back since noon. Why is Ayla so late? Isa cast a quick glance in the direction of Brout's hearth and saw him staring across the boundary stones at Ayla, against all good manners with a pleased smirk on his face. Kreb had taken in the whole scene, Ayla's bruise and swollen face and look of utter desolation, Browd watching her from the moment she returned with an arrogant sneer. He knew Browd's hatred had grown over the years. Her placid obedience seemed to affect him worse than her girlish rebellion. But something had happened that gave Browd a sense of power over her. As perceptive as Kreb was, he could not have guessed the cause. Ayla was afraid to leave the hearth the next day, dawdling over her morning meal as long as she could. Browd was waiting for her, thinking of his intense excitement from the day before it had him stimulated and ready. When he gave her the signal, she almost bolted, but forced herself to assume the position. She tried to repress her cries, but the pain forced them from her lips, causing curious glances from those who happened to be nearby. They could no more understand why she was crying out in pain than they could understand Browd's sudden interest in her. Browd reveled in his newfound dominance over Ayla and used her often, though many people wondered why he chose the ugly woman he hated over his own comely mate. After a time, it was no longer painful, but Ayla detested it, and it was her hatred that Browd enjoyed. He had put her in her place, gained superiority over her, and finally found a way to make her react to him. It didn't matter that her response was negative. He preferred it. He wanted to see her cower, to see her fear to see her force herself to submit. Just thinking about it stimulated him. He had always had a strong drive. Now he was more sexually active than ever. Every morning that he wasn't away hunting, he waited for her, usually forced her again in the evening and sometimes at midday as well. 
He even found himself aroused at night and used his mate to relieve himself. He was young and healthy, at the peak of his sexual prowess, and the more intensely she hated him, the more pleasure he derived. Ayla lost her sparkle. She was dispirited, morose, unresponsive to anything else. The only emotion she felt was an all-consuming hatred of Browd and his daily penetration of her. Like a massive glacier that sucks all moisture from the surrounding land, her loathing and bitter frustration drained away all other feelings. She had always kept herself clean, washing herself and her hair in the stream to keep it free of lice, even bringing in large bowls of snow to set beside the constantly burning fire to melt for fresh water in winter. Now her hair hung limp in greasy tangles, and she wore the same wrap day in and day out, not bothering to clean the spots or let it air out. She dragged at her chores until men who had never before scolded were rebuking her. She lost interest in Isa's medicines, never talked except to answer direct questions, seldom hunted and often returned empty-handed when she did. Her despondency cast a pall on everyone else around Krebs' hearth. Isa was beside herself with worry. She couldn't understand the drastic change in Ayla. She knew it was because of Browd's inexplicable interest in her, but why it should have that effect was beyond the woman. She hovered over Ayla, watching her constantly, and when the young woman first began to get sick in the mornings, she was afraid that whatever evil spirit had gotten into her was gaining a greater hold. But Isa was an experienced medicine woman. She was the first to notice when Ayla did not keep herself in the nominal isolation required of women when their totems battled, and watched her adopted daughter even closer. She could hardly believe what she suspected, but by the time another moon had passed and the summer was waxing into full heat, Isa was sure. Early one evening, when Kreb was away from the hearth, she beckoned to Ayla. I want to talk to you. Yes, Isa, Ayla replied, hauling herself up from her fur and slumping down in the dirt near the woman. When was the last time your totem battled, Ayla? I don't know. Ayla, I want you to think about it. Have the spirits fought within you since the blossoms dropped? The young woman tried to think. I'm not sure. Maybe once? That's what I thought, Isa said. You're getting sick in the mornings, aren't you? Yes, she nodded. Ayla thought her sickness was because every morning that Browd wasn't gone hunting, he was there, waiting for her, and she hated it so much she was losing her breakfast and sometimes her evening meal, too. Have your breasts felt sore? A little. And they've grown larger, too, haven't they? I think so. Why are you asking? Why all these questions? The woman looked at her seriously. Ayla, I don't know how it happened. I can hardly believe it, but I'm sure it's true. What's true? Your totem has been defeated. You are going to have a baby. A baby? Me? I can't have a baby. Ayla protested. My totem is too strong. I know, Ayla. I can't understand it. But you are going to have a baby, Isa repeated. A look of wonder crept into Ayla's unresponsive eyes. Can it be true? Can it really be true? Me? Have a baby? Oh, mother, how wonderful! Ayla... You're not made it. I don't think there's a man in the clan who will take you even as a second woman. You can't have a child without a mate. It might be unlucky, Isa motioned earnestly. It would be best to take something to lose it. I think mistletoe would be best. You know, the plant with the small white berries that grows high in the oak? It's very effective and, if properly handled, not too dangerous. I'll make you a tea of the leaves with just a few berries. It will help your totem expel the new life. 
It will make you a little sick, but... No, no! Ayla was shaking her head vigorously. Isa, no! I don't want to take mistletoe. I don't want to take anything to lose it. I want a baby, mother. I've wanted one ever since Uba was born. I never thought it would be possible. But Ayla, what if the baby is unlucky? It might even be deformed. It won't be unlucky. I won't let it. I promise. I'll take good care of myself so it will be healthy. Didn't you say a strong totem helps to make a healthy baby once it succumbs? And I'll take good care of it after it's born. I won't let anything happen. Isa, I've got to have this baby, don't you see? My totem may never be defeated again. This may be my only chance. Isa looked into the pleading eyes of the young woman. It was the first spark of life she had seen since the day Browd beat her while she was out hunting. She knew she should insist that Ayla take the medicine. It wasn't right for an unmated woman to give birth if it could be helped. But Ayla wanted the baby so desperately she might go into a worse depression if she was made to give it up. And maybe she was right. It might be her only chance. All right, Ayla, she acquiesced. If you want it so much, it would be best not to mention it to anyone yet. They'll know soon enough. Oh, Isa, she said, and gave the woman a hug. As the miracle of her impossible pregnancy filled her, a smile danced across her face. She jumped up, charged with energy. She couldn't sit still. She just had to do something. Mother, what are you cooking tonight? Let me help. Oryx stew, the woman replied, amazed at the sudden transformation in the young woman. You can cut up the meat if you want. As the two women worked, Isa realized she had almost forgotten what a joy Ayla could be. Their hands flew, talking and working, and Ayla's interest in medicine suddenly returned. I didn't know about mistletoe, mother, Ayla remarked. I know about ergot and sweet rush, but I didn't know mistletoe could make a woman lose a baby. There will always be some things I haven't told you about, Ayla, but you'll know enough, and you know how to test. You will always be able to keep learning. Tansy will work too, but it can be more dangerous than mistletoe. You use the whole plant, flowers, leaves, roots, and boil it. If you fill the water up to here, Isa pointed to a mark on the side of one of her medicine bowls, and boil it down to a cup this size, Isa held up a bone cup, it should be about right. One cup is usually enough. Chrysanthemum flowers sometimes work. It's not as dangerous as mistletoe or tansy, but not always effective either. That would be better for women who tend to lose babies easily. It's better to use something milder if it will work, less dangerous. That's right. And Ayla, there's something else you should know about. Isa looked around to make sure Kreb was still gone. No man must ever learn of this. It is a secret known only to medicine women, and not all of them know it. It's best not even to tell a woman. If her mate asked her, she'd have to tell him. No one will ask a medicine woman. If a man ever found out, he would forbid it. Do you understand? Yes, mother, Ayla nodded, surprised at Isa's secrecy and very curious. I didn't think you'd ever need to know this for yourself, but you should know it as a medicine woman anyway. Sometimes, if a woman has a very difficult birth, it's best if she never has any more children. A medicine woman can give her the medicine without ever telling her what it is. There are other reasons why a woman might not want a child. Some plants have special magic, Ayla. They make a woman's totem very strong. Strong enough to stop a new life from ever starting. You know magic to prevent pregnancy, Isa? Can a weak woman's totem become that strong? Any totem? Even if a Mogur makes a charm to give strength to a man's totem? Yes, Ayla. That's why a man must never find out. I used it myself after I was mated. I didn't like my mate. I wanted him to give me to another man. 
I thought if I never had children, he wouldn't want to keep me, Isa confessed. But you did have a child. You had Uba. Maybe after a long time, the magic loses strength. Maybe my totem didn't want to fight anymore. Maybe he wanted me to have a child. I don't know. Nothing works all the time. There are forces stronger than any magic, but it worked for many years. No one understands spirits completely, not even Magur. Who would have thought your totem could be defeated, Ayla? The medicine woman glanced around quickly. Now, before Kreb comes, you know the little yellow vine with tiny leaves and flowers? Golden thread? Yes, that's the one. Sometimes it's called strangleweed because it kills the plant it grows on. Let it dry, crush about this much in the palm of your hand, boil it in enough water to fill the bone cup until the decoction is the color of ripe hay. Drink two swallows every day that the spirit of your totem is not fighting. Doesn't it also make a good poultice for stings and bites? Yes, and that gives you a good reason to have it around. But the poultice is used on the skin outside the body. To give your totem strength, you drink it. There's something else you must take while your totem is fighting. The root of antelope sage, dried or fresh. Boil it and drink the water. One bowl every day you are isolated, Isa continued. Isn't that the plant with the ragged leaf that's good for Krebs arthritis? That's the one. I know of one other but I've never used it. It's the magic of another medicine woman. We traded knowledge. There is a certain yam. It doesn't grow around here, but I'll show you how it is different from the ones that do. Cut it into chunks and boil it down and mash it into a thick paste, then let it dry and pound it into a powder. It takes a lot, half a bowl of the powder mixed with water to make it a paste again. Every day you are not isolated when the spirits are not fighting. Kreb entered the cave and saw the two women deeply engrossed in conversation. He could see the difference in Ayla immediately. She was animated, attentive, thoughtful, smiling. She must have snapped out of it, he thought, limping toward his hearth. Isa, he announced loudly to get their attention. Must a man starve around here? The women jumped up, looking a little guilty, but Kreb didn't notice. He was so pleased to see Ayla busily working and talking, he didn't see Isa. "'It'll be ready soon, Kreb,' Ayla motioned, and smiling, ran up and gave him a hug. It made Kreb feel better than he had for a long time. As he settled down on his mat, Uba came running into the cave. "'I'm hungry,' the little girl gestured. You're always hungry, Oba, Ayla laughed as she picked up the girl and swung her around. Oba was delighted. It was the first time Ayla felt like playing with her all summer. Later, after they had eaten, Oba crawled into Kreb's lap. Ayla was humming under her breath while she helped Isa clean up. Kreb sighed contentedly. It felt much more like home. Boys are very important, he thought, but I think I like girls better. They don't have to be big and brave all the time, and don't mind cuddling up in a lap to go to sleep. I almost wish Ayla were still a little girl. Ayla woke the next morning wrapped in a warm glow of anticipation. I'm going to have a baby, she thought. She hugged herself, lying in her furs. Suddenly, she was eager to get up. I think I'll go down to the stream this morning. My hair needs a washing. She bounced out of bed, but a wave of nausea overcame her. Maybe I'd better eat something solid to see if it will stay down. I've got to eat if I want my baby to be healthy. It didn't stay down, but after she was up for a while, she ate again and felt better. She was still thinking about the miracle of her pregnancy when she left the cave and started for the stream. Ayla! Browd sneered as he swaggered up and made the signal. Ayla was startled. She had forgotten all about Browd. 
she had more important things to think about, like warm, cuddly, nursing babies. Her own warm, cuddly, nursing baby. Might as well get it over with, she thought, and patiently assumed the position for Broad to relieve his needs. I hope he hurries. I want to go down to the stream and wash my hair. Broad felt deflated. Something was missing. There was no response in her at all. He missed the excitement of forcing her against her will, her seething hatred and bitter frustration, which she had never quite succeeded in covering before, were gone. She wasn't fighting him anymore. She acted as though he wasn't even there, as though she didn't feel a thing. She didn't. Her mind was in another realm. She no more noticed his penetration than his rebukes or sharp blows. It was just one more thing she had to accept, and she resigned herself to it. Her calm, self-possessed serenity had returned. Broud's enjoyment was in dominating her, not in the pleasure of the sexual experience. He found he wasn't stimulated anymore. He had trouble maintaining an erection. After a few times of not reaching a climax at all, he backed off and soon stopped altogether. It was too humiliating. She might as well be a stone for all her response, he thought. She's so ugly anyway. I've given her enough of my time. She doesn't even appreciate the honor of the future leader's interest. Ogo welcomed him back, relieved that he seemed to be over his unfathomable attraction for Ayla. She hadn't been jealous. It wasn't something to be jealous about. Broud was her mate, and he gave no indication he was ready to give her up. Any man could relieve his needs with any woman he wanted. There was nothing extraordinary about that. She just couldn't understand why he paid so much attention to Ayla when, for some strange reason, she obviously didn't enjoy it. For all his rationalizing, Broud was galled at Ayla's sudden indifference. He thought he had finally found a way to dominate her, to break down her wall of reserve once and for all, and he had discovered the pleasure it gave him. It made him all the more determined to find a way to get to her again.